This is CSAP Science and Policy Podcast, where we're bringing you the latest evidence and expertise to improve public policymaking. This week, we're proud to present a bonus episode on Getting to Net Zero, which features content from our 2020 Virtual Annual Conference. This episode has been produced in partnership with Cambridge Zero and is hosted by Dr. Emily Shuckborough. You're listening to the CSAP virtual seminar focused around how do we globally achieve net zero and and enact a, a green recovery. And the intention is to discuss the drivers for getting to net zero to discuss green recovery. I imagine we're going to be talking about that quite a lot. How to foster innovation, investor confidence and international cooperation as we transition the global economy to a net zero economy. So we've got an excellent set of panelists who are going to address those issues of jobs, growth, competitiveness, and what policymakers can do to ensure that the transition is just, resilient, and inclusive. I'm going to ask the first speaker, who's Dimitri Zengelis, to talk to you. Dimitri has many roles, but one of which is as a senior associate at the Bennett Institute uh, for Public Policy here at the University of Cambridge. Okay, so I, I, I guess from a sort of policy perspective at the moment, we we face a number of objectives. The first, of course, is to manage the lockdown. But thereafter, um, we have to think about recovering from the lockdown. And uh, we, at the moment, the nature uh, and depth and indeed breadth across the world, the synchronized slowdown is so unique that we really do face the risk of a global depression of historic proportions. So the number one objective, of course, is to avoid that and manage that. That will require putting uh, unemployed resources to work. But in particular, you know, unlike recovery or reconstruction after a war, the, the real thing that we need to reconstruct is likely to be uh, confidence. In the short run, we face you know, the classic Keynesian paradox of thrift where if everybody believes there's going to be a deep depression, then businesses cut back on uh, investment, uh, they stop hiring labor, consumers stop spending, and uh, banks retrench on credit. Of course, if everybody behaves in the same manner, then that prediction of a depression becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That's the short-run challenge. But of course, in the long run, we still have the challenge of building a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable economy. The climate crisis has not gone away, it's still there. So the obvious intuition is to say, well, if we've got unemployed resources, um, why not put them to uh, good use? Why not try and build back better? Uh, And it turns out that some of the kind of sustainable, resource-efficient technologies actually have some very desirable qualities in both the short run and the long run. And they both can help align expectations and stimulate confidence because getting out of a recession really does mean selling a much better vision of the of the future in order to try and harness business investment and business confidence to try and build the kind of economy that we actually need. So uh, we need to counteract the contractory pressures. We need to create jobs in the short run. It turns out that uh, construction projects like insulation retrofits or building wind turbines tend to be less tradable and therefore not susceptible to imports and offshoring. Uh, and they also tend to be quite labor intensive. So they have quite high multipliers in the short run. But in the long run, they also have the advantage that they are actually very resource efficient and very productive. So once these things are built, they tend to be more productive. They tend to bring down long-term energy costs and provide increased efficiency, increased productivity, and increased innovation. So they have these very favorable growth qualities in the short and the long run, which generate large long-run multipliers. Now, from a fiscal perspective, and I'm a macroeconomist by background, This is really important because if the name of the game is to restore growth, but also, and we're hearing already comments about fiscal space and debt overhang for the public sector, if you are aiming to restore fiscal balance in terms of debt to GDP, it is really important that you don't undermine the denominator GDP. If you go into depression, debt to GDP will go up because GDP goes down, but it will also go up because the numerator will go up. The public revenues that are generated from taxes minus the spending that goes to uh, counter a cyclical slowdown through unemployment and other welfare benefits will be much lower in a low growth environment than in a high growth environment. So you get this double whammy where you're shrinking the numerator and expanding the denominator if what you aim to do in the short run is balance your budget because that takes away confidence, it breeds a sense of austerity just when people are already 
saving too much and spending too little. So if you're going to move towards a stronger economic outlook, then you really need to grow your way out of this mess. And if you're going to grow your way out of this mess, you want to do so in a way that is sustainable, that is resilient, that builds the economy that is competitive in the 21st century. Because if one thing is certain, the world will go low carbon, it will go resource efficient. And there's a huge amount of productive innovation that goes with that. There's many studies that show um, not only the kind of incredible, uh, spectacular reductions in costs on things like solar PV and, and battery storage, but also the spillovers to other sectors that are generated through pushing this kind of innovation. And of course, there are a number of other co-benefits in terms of reducing pollution, reducing congestion, improving energy efficiency, improving energy security, and reducing food waste, fiscal reform, and so on, that generate these very favorable long-term trends. And if, if you're going to make that transition, then now is the time to do it, because clearly there are unemployed resources. And if you're thinking of the long run, you want to invest in the kinds of assets that generate a resilient and sustainable economy. So that's not just infrastructure and physical assets and innovation, but it's the right uh, human capital, the skills and jobs that are necessary for the 21st century, and making sure that you reskill and retool those that are affected by change so that you future-proof those skills. It means investing in natural capital. It also means investing in social capital as well, so that you have a society with a level of trust that enables functional institutions to, to operate uh, effectively. And we've seen some of the consequences of undermining social capital. And of course, it means investing in knowledge capital, which is uh, where the whole innovation story comes in and working with some of the technological trends that we're seeing across the world in the, what's called the fourth industrial revolution, uh, things like AI, or automation, internet of things, big data, uh, nanotechnologies, and all the rest of it. These changes are gonna happen. There will be winners and losers, and it's really important that we re-equip uh, retool and reskill the losers from that change and also make the economy resilient to that change and manage it in a way that generates genuine opportunities. You know, we are not alone in thinking this way. There's a study that we put out recently with Oxford University where we actually sampled some 230 odd uh, experts across the uh, financial and macro community. And what we find is that those circles which have high returns, both in terms of climate impact and long run multipliers, tend to be uh, generally the ones that are sustainable and green. A lot of this is clean energy, it's buildings upgrades, it's green spaces and so on. So the sense we're getting here is that actually the government doesn't have to do very much to provide a credible policy framework to push a vision that is already becoming readily accepted, both within the policy community and the investor community, which namely says, let's invest in the assets of the future. Let's not look back to the 19th century and invest in the kinds of assets, physical assets, human assets, uh, social capital, natural capital as well, that isn't resilient, that's likely to be either devalued or become stranded in the 21st century. We have a short run opportunity to get people back to work and grow the economy out of debt. We have a long run opportunity to build the kind of economy we need for the future. Thank you very much, Dimitri. And just one question before we move on to the next speaker. The one thing you emphasised quite a lot at the beginning of your presentation was confidence and the importance of confidence. Is there one thing that you would particularly point to as part of a green recovery package that you would say that particularly spoke to maintaining that and, and supporting confidence? Uh, the short answer is no, there's no silver bullet. What's important to restore confidence is to make sure that the policy framework is coherent and that all policy elements seem to be pulling in the same way. So you send a very clear signal to investors. Like I say, in the short run, you've got to get people confident that the economy is going to recover and then they behave in a way that becomes self-fulfilling. In the long run, if you want to galvanize business investment in sustainable, resource-efficient technologies, what you don't want is to have a sense that the policy signals are mixed and muddled, no one's going to invest, it's going to be eye-wateringly expensive. If you send those kinds of signals, of course, nobody invests. If, on the other hand, people believe that the policy framework is supportive, the cost of technologies are coming down, the finance is going from niche to mainstream, they'll start thinking, well, I better invest in this, because, or at least um, you know, strategically as a risk management and hedging strategy, I should do something about being resilient to this kind of economy. And the very act of investing in these sectors then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because that is what brings the cost down. It makes the policy easier. It allows new business lobbies to emerge. And of course, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is replete with what we call tipping sets and path dependencies, which means essentially that the power of policy 
to help influence the way we build our economy is much greater than usual. The future really isn't, it's not going to drop out as manna from heaven. The future economy is for us to design and for us to build. So let's not sit there and speculate about what's it, what it's going to cost. Let's actually design it and manage and steer it. Thank you very much, Dimitri. The, the next speaker we have up is Laura Diaz-Anadon, who's Professor of Climate Change Policy in the Department of Land Economy. And so over to you, Laura. Thank you, Emily. So I want to convey four key messages as part of this presentation. The first one is we need to build a more inclusive, sustainable, resilient society. And these three dimensions have become more critical and urgent in the wake or in the middle of this COVID pandemic. Now, the second point that I want to make is that doing this will require a systemic and purposeful policy effort that represents a step change. And, and I'll talk a little bit about this. And the last point that I will conclude with is that this point about co-benefits. Uh, and we've talked about environmental, biodiversity co-benefits, inclusiveness. But I wanted to mention political co-benefits, something that is important to consider as we think about policies to get us out of this crisis is the fact that we'll need sustained systemic changes. And these are only sustainable if we actually have uh, public support. So the politics of this transition are really important. So I, I wanted now to move on this question of co-benefits, right? So we've talked about climate damages. And uh, the thing that I wanted to mention is that some of the local benefits from moving away from fossil fuels, from reconfiguring the system, are more local, not only local, but more local. And there's been a lot of research over the past 10 to 20 years trying to estimate the human health impact of uh, local air pollution from fossil fuel combustion, from coal power plants, from internal combustion engines. And also there's been a lot of research trying to quantify, estimate the impacts on ecosystems. And, and one of the UK efforts on this is led by our colleague, uh, Sir Partha Das Gupta here in Cambridge. And without getting into much detail, um, you know, there's a lot of papers on this topic. And I just wanted to mention one from the Institute for Climate Research. And basically they tried to craft three different scenarios. One that was about countries uh, delivering on their nationally determined contributions, the NDCs that have been mentioned, some scenario that the Paris two degree target, the third scenario uh, less ambitious than the two degree target involved a global coal exit. And here they try to estimate, and again, these are estimates, nothing is perfect. This is, we can't predict the future, but the interesting thing from uh, some of these research is that even just these local health, human health benefits and ecosystem benefits are big and are alone, alone compensate for even estimates of short-term policy costs. So I, I just wanted to give a sense of the magnitude of these local benefits, of course, and the additional benefits of avoided climate change damages. Now, of course, one key thing of this type of research is that it doesn't say very much about distributional impact and inclusive growth. And here is where I wanted to talk a little bit about the perspective of the transition from a policy evaluation uh, perspective. And here, as I has been mentioned pre uh, previously, most of my work has been in the energy sector, so not so much in agriculture, which is a fourth, uh, also very important. So I'll focus most of my examples in the area I've been working on. And here what we know is that all of these technologies that we have, uh, government policy throughout the world at different points in time has been critical in not just the existence of these technologies, but also on their uh, really significant cost improvements over time. Again, some of the numbers we've mentioned in solar PV, 82% cost reduction over the past 10 years of 15,000 since uh, you know the 50s and 60s, uh, lithium-ion batteries, 89%. These are really tremendous cost reductions. And the interesting thing when when we think about policies and how they've been driven by a mix of technology push, so R&D, research and development investments, and different market pull up approaches. In some cases, subsidies. In some cases, regulation, standard. In some cases, combinations of both. What it was really interesting is that all of these policies were put in place without really any idea or any expectation that costs would come down as much as they have. So again, this is also supporting this idea of get the ball rolling, even if we don't know exactly what the cost might, might be, because in these cases, there were positive um, surprises. So what, is, what are all of these policies, right? And we already heard some indications about countries taking turns, again, not in a coordinated manner, um, but more organically, they've done this. And I think this, this does point to the, the value of coordination, because if anything, that might speed things up even more. So what is it that we've learned from all of these feeding tariffs, options, uh, tax credits, fuel standards for vehicles, and so forth? 
one thing to say off the bat that is related to the point that Dimitri made about buildings and retrofitting is that there's a lot of room for action in this really important area. There's been less action in this space than in others. Uh, but the second thing that I wanted to say when it comes to market fault policies is that there's been a lot of research and we are, we've been working, and here this is um, work that we're doing as part of a European H2020 project, and we've been trying to put together some sense of what the impact of different policies, market fault policies from building codes to feeding tariffs to uh, price on carbon on different societal outcomes. So we've looked at environmental effects, technological effects, cost-related innovation, competitiveness, and distributional outcomes. And what we've seen from this work is that for some policies, and here we have building codes, there is not much evidence on some outcomes. So here, the fact that we have innovation incentives and competitiveness great for building codes reflects the fact there's, there's been less research, less policy evaluation on this. For some other areas, for things like auctions, feeding tariffs, tax credits, tax incentives, there's been a lot of work and we do have evidence that uh, short-term distributional impacts exist. So this is uh, going back to the point about designing to avoid some of the short-term distributional impacts. So this could be on low-income consumers or have been on low-income consumers and in other cases, for example, in small companies which may not have been able to benefit from some of these policies. So again, from this policy evaluation work, we know uh, where we, how we can design these policies to minimize uh, some of these impacts. And the last thing that I wanted to say when it comes to what is it that we know about the impacts of some of these market food policies is related to demand for workers. And again, this is something that has been alluded to. There's been a lot of work on this. To what extent are climate policies, some of these prices on carbon or, or other incentives, to what extent are they changing the demand for labor of different classes or, or types and then finally, I wanted to talk about uh, another big component that we've worked on, and this is on R&D investments, research and development. This is going more towards the long term. So I talked a little bit about short term impacts. Of course, R&D is more about a long term uh, investment. And what we see, this is just general R&D investment, is that there's a big opportunity to invest in R&D to improve productivity. And the opportunities are larger in targeting fintech R&D because there are growing markets. We have more and more of these technologies. They're getting cheaper. They're, you know, we, when we look at the fraction of our investments in the world, they're grow, going more to uh, renewables, for example. And there's also this additional societal benefit and spillovers that have, uh, we have talked about. And in fact, in some of the work we're, we're doing, we've been spillovers between the green energy technologies or the clean technologies. So we have an opportunity to invest in R&D and to target it in clean tech. And um, we have seen that over time, over the past 10 years or so, uh, countries in the OECD, this is data from OECD countries, from the International Energy Agency, they have increased their investments in energy research development and demonstration. They're not yet at the levels of the late 70s and early 80s. And all of the research that we have shows that you know, additional investments would yield positive returns, including um, all these different benefits. So there's still room to increase. We are on an upward trajectory, but we need more. And then the other thing that we need, in addition to the fact that we're on this upward trajectory, but we need more, is how to design these run investments. And here, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through this, but there's you know, a list of guiding principles for this expanded effort related to how to allocate research related to technology transfer to demonstration projects, which is an important area for international cooperation. We have itself international cooperation, very importantly, adopting an adaptive learning strategy to learn how some of these different principles or institutions work in different countries. And again, keeping funding stable and predictable, this question about having framework for investment, both in R&D and deployment, is essential to inspire confidence. And this is something that is going up. And then the last point is uh, public funding and uh, R&D funding and collaboration has been identified as, as being particularly important in the clean tech space for small and medium enterprises. So looking at competitiveness and innovation outcomes. So there's a lot of converting research in this area. So this suggests that in this uh, recovery that is going to be uh, hopefully focused on resilient, sustainable and inclusive, that there's an opportunity to target funding to SMEs. And finally, and this is the last point, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, to obtain or to 
succeed in making this long-term transition to a more sustainable, resilient economy, the interaction between clean tech innovation, understood as both R&D and deployment and policies, is essential. There's also a lot of recent research from the political science literature that suggests that these core benefits that we're talking about, be it jobs, reduce local air pollution, improve ecosystems, shape public opinion and build support for these sorts of actions. And then the other really interesting piece of evidence supporting this linkage between the clean tech sector and public support for climate policies, for example, is that the more of this innovation you have, the more interest groups are created. So not just there's not just fossil fuel interest groups, there's also renewables interest groups. And when you have these new industries, you create new winners, and then this creates momentum. So I think that having this sort of confidence, creating these new technologies can actually yield more support for these efforts. And I'm going to uh, stop here. I just wanted to say thank you and recognize a lot of my co-authors. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. We're going we're gonna to start off with a little bit of discussion specifically around road recovery competitiveness and those kinds of questions. So let me see. There's, there's one question that's come in that's sort of starting to get into the details of, of, I guess, exactly what portfolio packages there might be a, a, around that. And it says uh, that a recent report from the Green Finance Institute highlighted the um, additional benefits of retrofitting um, energy efficiency based programs can have in terms of green recovery. And yet that's the sort of thing is very much missing from NDCs, that's element. And so the question is, what incentives are, or levers are needed to push this further to ensure that energy efficiency improvements become a priority. So I don't know whether anyone wants to comment about that. I mean, clearly, there's, um, you know, this whole question of heating, how do we heat our homes and businesses, and then that linking into energy efficiency. And, and I guess also questions around has the, the whole landscape changed, or is the landscape going to change post, you know, us all working from home much more in terms of some of those um, aspects around um, energy efficiency and the relative ways where you want to put your policies associated with that. So I don't know whether anyone has any comments around that. I'm happy to just say something brief since I mentioned this in passing. Uh, and I think um, there's two key things in this question of retrofits which are very important. The first is that you need a workforce that can do them. And in a lot of countries that haven't had a lot of focus on energy efficient buildings, there's actually a lot of people who are working in the sector who cannot do this. This is going back to the point about skills and training. So you need more skills and training in the sector, but you also need subsidies. You need to subsidize this, especially because low income households might not be able to do this. Otherwise, these things have a cost. And we do know that subsidies, and again, I would focus especially on low income households. We, we need this sort of thing for retrofits because just having more uh, stringent building costs for new builds, it's not enough. Um, of course, you know, we have a very old housing stock here in the UK and many, many other countries. So I would focus on those two things. There's starting to be a lot of, of talk, that was mentioned apparently in Davos yesterday, of the Great Reset. You know, there, there really, you know, there clearly is a bit of an opportunity here for really progressing at scale things that might have otherwise been very difficult to achieve. Um, and there's possibly quite a short window uh, to be able to do that, both at a, a national and an international level. Are there any things that you would particularly point out? as being things that let's really try and accelerate action at a much bigger scale than we might otherwise have done. I mean, yeah, one, one could be heating. How do we decarbonize heating in homes in the UK is a massive issue. Is now, is this, is this the right time to really push on that and, do, and link that through to jobs? Or, or, or are there other ideas and things that we really, you know, this is a unique opportunity that we could make a step change, which would otherwise have been very difficult as part of a great reset. Emily, if I may. Obviously, improving residential efficiency and, and retrofits it tends to be labor intensive. It means training workers in building the buildings that we need tomorrow. So there's a, a big training story here. You really don't want to be training engineers and, 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 and builders and construction workers and architects to be building you know, high uh, resource intensive, high carbon, leaky buildings. That's in nobody's interest. You can link it into behavioral change because if you're going to work from home, you want to cut your uh, energy costs much more than if you're in in an office all day. And in terms of scale, I mean, I, you know, you've got to recognize that the sectors we're talking about, uh, transport, buildings, and energy infrastructure, are amongst the most heavily policy-driven and regulated sectors in the economy. And that's not coincidence, it's because they are prone to these big network effects, which means, again, that the, the impact of policy measures uh, and it could, it could be fiscal measures, uh, it could be standards and regulations, it could be support for R&D and deployment, or it could just frankly be procurement. You know, about a, a quarter of all spending in the UK is 
completely government based. The government has a huge ability just through its own spending power to change uh, behavior on the ground. Uh, and then it could finally involve targeted investment in infrastructure and scaling up finance through institutional reforms like a, an investment bank, a national investment bank. So you need this sort of mix of policies that are coherent and self-reinforcing. You can't just have sort of you know, a green roof there and a coal power station here. That's not, a, uh, that's not sufficiently coherent to tip a transition at scale and to get the kind of investment and finance that, that we need. So I'm going to combine two questions and, and then we'll move on to talking about the sort of the fair, just transition um, side of things. So there's one question that came in around, you know, obviously uh, public sector budgets potentially take quite a hit here. Where do you see a role for public sector in needing the uh, green recovery and stimulus? I think that probably Dimitri has spoken quite a bit about that already in terms of multipliers and so forth. But then a, a very specific question, not about the public sector, but about the private sector and particularly SME. And, and the policies that need to be put in place to really um, help support innovation in the SME sector. You know, uh, I, I've already said um, a fair bit about um, in our report that <laughs> put these multipliers in the range of 2 to 3% in a recession. So, you know, and, and, you know, as I've said already, some of these kind of green investments have uh, even higher multipliers than that. So that, that is really important to emphasise that, you know, the best way um, to get debt sustainability is to grow your way out of the uh, recession. Not just debt sustainability, you end up with the same debt to DGP, but you've got people in jobs uh, and you've got people with higher wages and you've got a productive economy rather than one that's in outright depression. That should be um, pertinent to politicians because uh, they ought to care about, uh, about things, like, things like that. Um, SMEs, local support, the whole issue of industrial strategy um, and institutions, um, you know, it, it is really kind of uh, crucially important uh, as well. Um, I mean, there's the, the, this plays into the whole um, story of institutional and uh, structures across the UK economy, the, the role of uh, regional and, uh, and local government. Um, as I've mentioned already, the, uh, uh, the, the call for a national investment bank and the fact that as the government takes over a lot of sectors uh, by bailing them out or providing equity and loan support, um, it increases and enhances the role of industrial policy uh, because the government will directly or indirectly have a greater stake in the uh, economy. So it can influence the direction even more than it has in the past by imposing conditionalities on some of the, those loans and some of those equity states. We're now going to move on to the next section of questions. But what about ordinary people, communities and local authorities? Um, where, what do you, you know, what, where do you see them having a role? What do you want people to actually do? Um, and I'm going to link into that as well because I think it, in, in part it relates. Another question that says, how can we best incorporate race, gender, equality, and inclusivity goals into policies um, to achieve net zero? So, um, bringing things down to a much more granular level, what, what, what do you see as being the priorities? Um, the UK has vast potential to invest in planting trees, restoring degraded uh, wetlands, greening up cities, improving biodiversity. You know, there's a sharp rise of available young workers who could do that. And it tends to build social solidarity as well. You know, people who are previously employed in the retail and entertainment and food sectors could be um, doing stuff that actually not only keeps them busy, but is, is socially uh, inclusive uh, and advantageous in, in that respect. You know, a big part of building back better is about inclusivity. That's why we talk about social capital. Um, that's why we talk about the social sector. Andy Haldane estimates that that accounts for something like 10% equivalent of GDP. You know, these are voluntary uh, and charitable sectors. And yet they uh, largely fall out of the scope of GDP because they're not measured directly. Social capital is a very, very kind of, has a very high rate of return. Um, in terms of investment. And it also uh, helps to build back uh, trust in the social contract. People feel that their policymakers and governments are representing and accountable to their interests. And there's been a disconnect since the last recovery from the great financial crash. And I think a big part of this recovery is not to repeat that mistake again. We don't have that chance. 
Thank you. So there was a, there was an interesting bit in one of those in one of the questions um, around specifically around local authorities and what local authorities can do. And my impression is that there's often a bit of a, a knowledge gap. A lot of, in this country, a lot of local authorities have all been declaring climate emergencies, but where they're slight, still at the moment slightly stuck on is what that that means that they should actually be doing, and and how at a local authority level they ought to be um, thinking about green recovery. But I'm not going to ask any more questions on that because we don't have very much time left, and I want to move on to the international. Um, side of things in the last five minutes. Uh, so, so there's a question that's come in um, that says, much of the narrative that we've had so far is um, aimed towards wealthier countries that have the fiscal space to support broad expansive stimulus packages um, with accompanying uh, policy packages. But for low income and least developed countries, this may not be the case. What are your thoughts and recommendations to support these countries as they face economic downturns from COVID impacts, both domestic and global, in the context of getting on track to net zero. Where should the focus um, of developing countries and least developed countries be? Look, we're not doing uh, developing countries a service if um, they are investing in the industries of yesterday, which are either going to be, and the, and the sectors and the assets of yesterday, which will either be devalued or stranded or rendered uncompetitive because of uh, hostile uh, climate policies or uh, new technologies that undercut them. Um, developing countries in some respects have opportunities to leapfrog, uh, so for example distributed energy rather than uh, grid infrastructure, which they're not in many cases burdened with, certainly not to the same extent as rich countries, similar kind of thing that we've seen in mobile phones replacing fixed line phones, but they will need access to finance uh, and there is a huge responsibility on the rich world uh, to provide both the finance and the institutional capacity to get that finance to flow uh, to some of the poorer countries, because very often they lack that institutional capacity. Um, not just finance, but technology transfer as well. So I think it's really important that, um, you know, both for the sake of the global climate, but also for these countries' uh, development and growth plans, uh, that we support them also in building back better and investing in the right assets that render their economies resilient, competitive, uh, and secure in the uh, 21st century. I may add on this. We, we do, and uh, this, uh, I agree with what Dimitri said, and, and on the crucial role of international finance for developing countries. We do see that sometimes a little bit of money can make a big difference in the long term. So very often in these countries, there is institutional capacity, there isn't the technology, and the cost of capital is very high because you know nobody wants to invest, be the first mover in this. And actually, we have. Um, a project with a PhD student working on this very topic and looking at the role of the German Development Bank uh, supporting renewable um, technologies in Uganda. In over three years, the cost of capital went down by 30% uh, with, again, a really limited target approach. So they raised the technology, they created the capacity to integrate renewables in the grid. So there was a lot of, in, you know, part of the program was also this capacity building. So it's this sort of uh, relatively cheap interactions that can they risk the technology and they risk the financing because there's also learning by doing in financing. So uh, I agree there's a very important role for industrialist countries in helping this, um, developing countries leapfrog to the new economy. Okay, thank you very much. Now, unfortunately, we've come to the end of our um, time. Uh, so, uh, I, first of all, I'd like to thank the panelists very much for their contribution, and um, to all of those uh, listening, thank you. Um, I guess one, I mean, actually, picking up on one of the questions that that did come in, which was um, around, you know, often response to climate change is, is characterised in, in very sort of left wing terms, um, and and I guess also we've seen quite a lot um, recently in terms of sort of global. Globally, a much more of an emphasis on on, on a national, more nationalistic policies than on on a, um, on on what's inevitably required to address climate change at a global scale. And so, I think there is, you know, it does feel as though we are potentially sitting at, at a very interesting time in terms of the response to the global response to the current global crisis and whether or not we can through you know out of what is a very dismal global um, situation we find ourselves in find ways of extracting a very positive outcome from that in terms of trying to actually accelerate a, a global response to the climate crisis at the same time as recovering from the coronavirus crisis that we find ourselves in so and, and and I think finding ways of shaping that narrative in a way that that speaks to 
all different sectors of society in all different countries of the world is going to be absolutely um, critical. And, th and that's perhaps where we can show the greatest leadership as we take the UK um, presidency at COP26. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you again to the panelists and thank you to CSAP for organizing this event. CSAP Science and Policy podcast is a production of the Center for Science and Policy at the University of Cambridge. This bonus episode was produced in partnership with Cambridge Zero. This episode was hosted by Dr. Emily Shukbara and was produced by me, Kate McNeil. Our guests this week were Professor Laura Diaz Anadon and Dimitri Zangelis. You can learn more about CSAP's work by visiting us on Twitter at CSIPOL or by visiting our website at www.csap.cam.ac.uk. If you have feedback about this episode or questions you'd like us to address in a future week, please email inquiries at csap.cam.ac.uk. We'll be back with more bonus content throughout September, and please stay tuned for more information about our upcoming second season. Thanks for listening.